Now on that same day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still and looked sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. When they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women, women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road? While he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed. He has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come as the wind and cleanse. Come as the fire and burn. Convert and consecrate our lives to our great good and your great glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. This is my favorite one. And then, then this one comes along. This is the gospel for road trippers. I've just come back from a road trip. And I want to incorporate a bit of that. My brother Richard is having shoulder surgery in a couple of weeks. He is a nomad. He lives in a wonderful little what's called a toy hauler, which is a small ca camper and a trailer, and a big old truck, and, and, and he's got a great uh, golden retriever by the name of Bayen, and, um, and they've been traveling around the country shooting ducks. 
He was in Arizona recently. I was with him in the desert. And I do not come from desert country, but there's something exhilarating about being in the desert. Walking through the desert, I hear my footsteps, and it's not concrete. And there is a clarity in the air. And we were in the Arizona desert, and we were camping out. Poncho and Lefty was our theme song. If you don't know Poncho and Lefty, it's worth a listen to. Jesus is not mentioned, but I'm sure he's there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> and I had a revelation that seems like a pretty big deal to me, and it, it relates to revelations about things we think we know, but we really don't. So I've been a little like, I'm going on there for a week to help him drive back. I'm thinking, I may make it three days before I check into a hotel. This is great. I love my brother. We used to live together. He's 15 years older than I am. Um, and what I experienced, because I've had some concern about this, him being out on the road, he's 75. that he wouldn't be at home, that somehow this wouldn't work. And what I experienced after being in this little camper and driving across the desert is that it's a home. At about 7 o'clock at night, we'd stop and set up camp. And then, because we live in the 21st century, we'd there's one bed. He gave me the bed, and he slept on the floor because of his shoulder. At least that's what he told me. About 7 o'clock, we'd crawl in bed together, you know, like a sleepover. And we'd put a box, a toaster box, right between us, and we'd put a laptop up on that. And then Bayen would want to get in, so Bayen's, you know, on the other side of the box at our feet. And we'd watch a movie. We'd, we'd watch Nomadland. That was the first one we watched. He hadn't seen it before either. We're like, oh, yeah, okay. And as I'm in there, and if we're doing this, and I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, I'm home. And this is a home. And I never, ever could have gotten to that understanding. And he said, I said to him, Richard, I said, this is a home. He said, I know. I know. I know, but I never could have gotten to that understanding without going on this road trip. I did not spend a night in a hotel. Why? I was home. And there are things that we cannot know on the outside. There are things that we can only know on the inside in the experience of life. And that's just what has happened. We have experienced, we have re-experienced something that we cannot explain, that we could not explain to another, but that somehow makes all of the difference in the world. And, and what is that thing? Well, that thing is an encounter with the unexpected, finding life where we only thought we would find despair. Now, Cleopas, I learned this, Cleopas is thought to be St. Joseph's brother, so Jesus' uncle, and he doesn't recognize him. There is in this the core of ritual for transformative change. Let me talk a, a little bit about that. Transformative change happens when there is separation from the normal, a period of disorientation, of not knowing how to orient ourselves, and then sticking with that process, the, the transformative change happens and there's a reintegration. So I know this story with Richard's kind of a little, kind of a silly story, but it's like 
separation. I'm outside of my life. I'm in a can. I'm sleeping in a can with wheels on it. It is disorienting. Something happens in that experience that changes my outlook on the world from fear to joy that my brother's getting to do this. And then reintegration. Part of that reintegration is for me to share this story with you and say, I know, can you believe it? Can you believe it? And this is exactly what happens. This process is exactly what happens. These guys are so lost. Talk about separation. Jesus has been torn from their lives. They don't know which, which end is up. I don't know who lives in Emmaus if they're going home. I don't know. I, I expect, but I don't know. And they're walking along the way. But here's what is so important I want us to notice. Cleopas and his travelers are not in despair. They are not in despair. And this is why I, I, I'm so, I want to be so careful and for us to be so careful about optimism. Because optimism is not hope. Optimism is an attachment to an outcome that we think we'll need or want. And the more we become attached to that outcome, the more rigid we become and the more prone to despair. These guys are not despairing. Let me tell you what happens when you despair. They're walking along. Someone comes up. What do you want? Well, I just want to know what you were talking about. Yeah, go away. Well, I want to tell you about Moses and all the prophets. You know, pal, that's the last thing I want to hear. Go away. How many of us, when we're going through a difficult thing, don't want to talk about it? When the very thing we need to do is talk about it and encounter with another, because that's how the grace gets in. The grace gets in because God, no matter what, is longing to bring new and good things out of the tragedy that is so often a part of our lives. So we experience separation. I just got news this week that a friend of mine from Michigan, her son's Crohn's disease is back. He's just a young guy. He was sick with Crohn's disease. He had, he had a medicine that was working and it stopped working. He was part of a couple that he and his wife wanted to have children and they couldn't have children, they couldn't have children. And I was about ready to stop praying for it because I don't want to, you know, it's kind of a sore subject, you know? I don't want to bring, I don't want to, well, we prayed for it. They got three little kids right now running around. And in having a conversation with this friend who's so distraught because of this terrible disease, I was reminded and I was able to remind her that, you know, prayer matters. Not because God is some puppet master that's going to just make everything right if we get enough people on board, if we just send enough chain letters, you know. But that those who put their trust in God, God cares for. Full stop. And these, these travelers, these disciples, losing everything, nonetheless, had the capacity, some intuitive sense that no matter what, God would be faithful and God would show up in ways that they couldn't have imagined. And so just like us, we come and we hear about the prophets and Moses, and we hear the stories of the Old Testament, and we hear the songs of hope and lament in the Psalms. And then we hear something from the New Testament. And by God's grace, hopefully, in the gospel and in something that's set up here, something is lit on fire in us, and we can have hope again. We can have hope and trust that God is up to something good, even in the midst of the worst of it. 
that God is always resurrecting from the horror of life something that is good. It's not something we want. It's not a return to what was. But it is something that allows us to reintegrate into our lives to be able to carry on and to carry on with hope and eventually carry on with joy. And here's the thing I think I love the most. They sit down and Jesus does, he breaks the bread, he blesses it, he shares it out, and then it says he vanished. I want to tell you, I think he vanished because at that moment he was in them. He was in them. They broke the bread, they shared it. All of a sudden, Christ is embodied in that little community just like us. I want you to notice something today. We bow at that altar a lot. And what we're really doing is we're bowing to the sacrament, the blessed sacrament that's reserved. But there's one time that we don't bow. Well, there are two times that each. One, you don't bow. When the, when the altar servers come up, they don't bow because I'm behind the altar, and that's just not right. It would be too confusing. You're not going to bow to me, okay? When you bring the gifts up, that's one thing. But when we process out, notice that we don't stop and bow. And that is because the fullness of the body of Christ is here in you. We have knit ourselves after receiving communion. We are the body of Christ. If anything, we should be bowing to each other. Oh, namaste, you know. And standing in awe that in us now is Christ and we are the bearers of that hope. Yes, we have been separated from that which we love. Yes, there is a period of disorientation. And yes, by God's grace, in that liminal space, in that in-between time, God's grace enters into the picture and somehow makes whole that which was shattered and gives us the resources to not only hope again, but to do so joyfully. I wish so much this for you and for me. I think I'm here to say words that I need to be reminded of because I need to be reminded that Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Amen.